Are you more valuable than a dog or a cat or, for that matter, a tree? One of the biggest differences between Judeo-Christian values and secular values concerns this very issue, the worth of the human being. According to the Judeo-Christian value system, human beings are infinitely valuable. On the other hand, secular humanism devalues the worth of humans. As ironic as it may sound, the God-based Judeo-Christian value system renders humans infinitely more valuable than any humanistic value system. The reason is simple. If there is no God, human beings are only material beings, and therefore not worth anything beyond the matter of which they are composed. But in the Judeo-Christian system, human beings are created in the image of God, meaning that human life is sacred. In other words, we are either created in the image of carbon atoms, and therefore not worth much more than carbon, or we are created in the image of God, and therefore infinitely valuable. Our secular post-Judeo-Christian society has rendered human beings less significant than at any time in Western history. First, the secular denial that human beings are created in God's image has led to humans increasingly being equated with animals. That's why, over the course of 30 years of asking high school and college students if they would first try to save their dog or a stranger, two-thirds have always voted against the person. They either don't know what they would do, or they actually vote for the dog. And many adults now vote similarly. Why? There are two reasons. One is that, with the denial of the authority of higher values, such as religious teachings, people increasingly make moral decisions on the basis of how they feel. And since just about everybody feels more for their dog than for a stranger, many people simply choose the dog. The other reason is that once you get rid of Judeo-Christian values, there's no reason for elevating human worth over that of an animal. That's why people estranged from Judeo-Christian values, including many Jews and Christians, support programs such as Holocaust on Your Plate. Holocaust on Your Plate is a campaign developed by the animal rights group People for the Ethical Treatment of Animals, PETA, that teaches that there is no difference between the barbecuing of chickens in America and the burning of Jews in the Holocaust. Why? Because a human and a chicken are of equal worth. So too, in a notorious Tucson, Arizona case, a woman screamed to firefighters that her three babies were in the burning house. Thinking that the woman's children were trapped inside, the firefighters risked their lives to save the woman's three cats. If you think these two examples are either just theoretical, the dog stranger question, or extreme, the Tucson mother of cats, here's an issue that is neither theoretical nor extreme. More and more people believe, as PETA does, that even if it would lead to a cure for cancer or AIDS, it would be wrong to experiment on animals. In fact, Many animal rights advocates believe that even to save a human life, it would be wrong to kill a pig to obtain a heart valve. The 20th century showed vividly what happens to human worth when Judeo-Christian values are abandoned. Nazi Germany and the various communist regimes all rejected Judeo-Christian values and ended up slaughtering the largest number of people in human history. For Nazism, Jews and members of other non-Aryan groups were declared worthless and murdered in the millions. For communists, human worth was determined solely by communist parties which murdered tens of millions of people. Only by rejecting Judeo-Christian values could Nazis declare Jews, Slavs, and others subhuman. And only by rejecting Judeo-Christian values could communist regimes slaughter those they called class enemies? Individual human life meant nothing. Meanwhile, human slavery was abolished only in the Judeo-Christian world. 
And of course, for nearly all those who reject Judeo-Christian values, the human fetus is worthless, if its mother deems it so. Finally, there is an increasingly vocal part of the environmentalist movement that also denigrates human worth. For these individuals, the human being is not infinitely precious. Trees and rivers and mountains are. So, are you more valuable than a dog or a cat or a tree? That depends on your value system. I'm Dennis Prager. We've all heard about how many bad things the U.S. government did to American Indians in the past. But what about today? Like most people, the only time I hear about today's American Indians is when people are outraged about sports mascots or team names, like the Washington Redskins. But sports teams' names are the least of Indians' problems. Did you know that Indians have the highest rate of poverty of any racial group in America? Did you know that alcoholism is more common among Indian youths than among youths in any other ethnic group? Did you know that the rate of child abuse among Indians is twice as high as the national average? Until I visited Indian reservations for my book, The New Trail of Tears, I didn't know any of this. What was at the root of these terrible problems, I wondered. And the deeper I dug, the more I realized that between the 19th century and today, nothing has changed. It's still the government. The two main agencies that oversee the activities of Indians who live on reservations are the Bureau of Indian Affairs, or BIA, and the Bureau of Indian Education, or BIE. Education, economic development, tribal courts, road maintenance, agriculture, and social services, the federal government basically funds and controls all of it. It's no wonder Indians say BIA stands for bossing Indians around. Together, these two agencies have combined budgets of $3 billion per year and have 9,000 employees. That's one employee for every 111 Indians on a reservation. Of that $3 billion per year, the BIE uses $850 million of it to educate 42,000 students. That's more than $20,000 per student, compared to a national average of $12,400 per student. Plenty of other federal agencies also have programs for Indians. For instance, the Indian Health Service had a 2015 budget of over $4.6 billion. And yet, there are widespread and documented reports of nurses being unable to administer basic drugs, of broken resuscitation equipment, and of unsanitary medical facilities. Obviously, inadequate funding isn't the problem. The billions of dollars that the federal government spends on Indians every year hasn't made their lives better. In fact, by most measures of economic and social health, the lives of American Indians are only getting worse. Aside from issues of culture, the only way out of this morass is economic growth. But the reservation system makes this almost impossible. Following a series of treaties and laws over many decades, some well-intentioned, some not, the federal government decided to hold Indian land, quote, in trust, in order to prevent non-Indians from ever buying that land. But other than Indians, the only people who have things held in trust for them are children and the mentally incompetent. Can anything better illustrate the low regard the government has for American Indians? The awful consequence of this land trust is that Indians can't sell their land, which means they can't use it the same way other Americans do. For example, as collateral to get a loan to start a business. What bank would lend to landowners who don't own their land? The other effect of this absurdity is that Indians can't develop this land that they don't own. Indian reservations contain almost 30% of the nation's coal reserves west of the Mississippi, 50% of potential uranium reserves, and 20% of known oil and gas reserves. Those resources are estimated to be worth nearly $1.5 trillion. But the vast majority of Indian lands with natural resources remain undeveloped because of federal regulations. For instance, for Indians to get permission to mine for coal on Indian land requires 49 steps spanning four federal agencies. Each of these 49 steps can take months or years to be approved. There are so many government regulations that just to apply for a permit to dig a hole 
cost $6,500. Is it really any wonder that this community is mired in poverty? So what can be done? For starters, end the trust system. Let Indians do what they want with the land they own. Get the massive federal bureaucracy out of the way. Give American Indians the opportunity to embrace the same thing that has lifted millions of other people out of poverty and into the middle class, free enterprise. It won't happen overnight and it won't be easy, but it will do a lot more for American Indians than changing the name of the Washington Redskins. I'm Naomi Schaefer Riley for Prager University. I am an Arab. I am a Muslim and I love my country. In fact, I'm prepared to die for it, which is why I serve in its army. I don't have to do this. I want to do this because my country is a special place, unlike any other, free, diverse, vibrant. Yet other countries, countries not so free, not so diverse, call for my country's complete destruction. The moment my country lets its guard down, it will be destroyed. My country is Israel. I grow up and still live in a small village named after my family's Bedouin Arab tribe. Our roots in this land run deep. In 1948, when Arab armies invaded the new state of Israel, my family thought of leaving our village. Some of them did. But when the Jews leaders heard that, they implored us to remain. This is our country. For both Arabs and Jews, they said. Stay and we will work together to build it. My family stayed, my parents were born here, made their lives here, started their own family here in Israel. In 2002, I was a teenager. It was a violent time. Palestinian suicide bombers were blowing up Israeli civilians, a danger to Arabs and Jews alike. Israeli troops entered the West Bank to stop them at their source. As a result, Many Palestinians were killed. I was torn. Whose side was I on? Israelis or the Palestinians? Is it possible to be an Arab and an Israeli? The question became even more difficult when I saw men from my own village wearing the uniform of the Israeli army. Only Jews are required to serve in the military. No one forced this Arab men to join. They chose it. Why? I asked them. Our home is here in Israel, they said. Our home is under attack. Our neighbors in this home are Jews. They are being attacked. We fight together. Still, I struggled. I went to high school in Nazareth. There, unlike the village where I grew up, most of the Arab students identified as Palestinian even though they are citizens of Israel. Some of the students, my friends, hated Israel. They couldn't understand me. You're a Palestinian, they said. So you must hate Israel. When I said that I didn't, that we had far more freedom and opportunity than Arabs anywhere in the Middle East, they called me a traitor. After high school, I went to study electrical engineering at that CNEO, a leading Israeli university. During my first semester, heavy rocket fire from Gaza forced Israel to launch a counterattack. Not long after the war began, I witnessed a group of Arab Israeli students expressing their solidarity with Hamas, the Palestinian terror organization that controls Gaza and is committed to Israeli's violent destruction. Did these students not understand that those rockets could just as easily be aimed at them? Hamas didn't care who they killed as long as they landed inside the borders of Israel. Had my fellow Arab students forgotten that Israel had left Gaza a few years before? That there wasn't a single Israeli living there? That day, I dropped out of school to join the Israeli army, the IDF. A few months later, I was a soldier in the Israeli Air Force. After months of training, I was assigned to the search and rescue helicopter unit. Our job was to save lives. We never concerned ourselves with the identity of the people who needed our help. We rescued Syrian civilians wounded in their country's civil war, Palestinian children from Gaza requiring urgent medical care, and countless Israelis of every religious and ethnic background. A life, whether it is Muslim or Jewish, Palestinian or Israeli, is a life. On a base of 6,000 soldiers, I was the only Bedouin. 
but it didn't matter. The only thing that mattered was keeping Israel, our home, safe. We came from all parts of the country and from many parts of the world. We wear every shade of skin color. Our shared goal created a deep bond. Today, I am a student at Haifa University. Half of the students are Arab. More than once, I have seen the Palestinian flag being waved at rally or protest on campus. In Israel, you can do this, because whether you are a Jew or an Arab, you are free. What more do you need to know? I am Mohamed Kabia for Braggart University. Do you wish you had better control over your temper? Do the people around you, your spouse, your friends, your boyfriend or girlfriend, your children, wish you had better control over your temper? Unfair or excessive anger is a major cause of marital strife, of tensions between parents and children, and of tensions in workplaces. Sometimes anger is responsible for more than just tension. Road rage, for example, is implicated in hundreds of deaths and thousands of accidents each year. Of course, anger is not always wrong. Sometimes it's absolutely necessary. There is evil in the world and sometimes in our own lives. If that didn't make us angry, neither nations nor individuals would ever oppose it. Think about it for a moment. Would you want to live in a world where no one except victims felt anger toward terrorists, rapists, and murderers? But that's not the sort of anger I am talking about now. I'm talking about day-to-day -day anger and the role an angry disposition plays in poisoning our daily lives and the lives of those around us. People with quick tempers sometimes say that they can't control their anger, but that's not true. People can't always control how they feel, but they can almost always control how they act. Let me offer an example. Imagine you're walking down the street when suddenly you're confronted by a person with a weapon demanding your money. No. Clearly, you're furious. But do you shout at the person? Do you curse him? Very unlikely. You speak in as calm a voice as you can, probably even in a respectful manner, if you speak at all. We all know why we would act in such a calm way in order to save our life. Obviously, then, we can control our tempers when we really want to. Now, there are whole courses on anger management, and they undoubtedly have many ideas and suggestions. But I would like to offer one rule that will enable you to control your anger and almost guarantee that you will never say something that will lead to an irrevocable break or a permanent hurt in your relationship with another person. No matter how angry you get, restrict the expression of your anger to the incident that provoked it. This means when someone has done something wrong and has hurt you, express anger for what they did, but only concerning that incident. Don't use words like always or never. You're always inconsiderate. You never think before you act. What's the other person supposed to say? You're right, I am always inconsiderate. In addition to making the other person defensive, who wouldn't become defensive when accused of always being anything bad, your statement is untrue. No one is always inconsiderate. No one never thinks before he or she acts. That someone has done something wrong to you doesn't give you the right to lie to or about them. Also, expressing thoughts like this is destructive in another way. One of the sad and unfair consequences of anger is that people think that what you say when you're angry is what you really think. Now, it might be, but usually it isn't what you really think. It's what you're thinking at that moment. Who hasn't had some really angry and unfair thoughts about their spouse, their child, or about a good friend? No one. But most of the time, we make sure not to express these angry thoughts, because the moment we express them, it becomes hard, if not impossible, for the other person to ever forget what you've said. A medieval philosopher offered wise guidance. 
I can take back words I didn't say, but I can't take back words I did say. How hard is it to practice this rule? For some, it might be pretty hard. For others, less so. But everyone can do it. You have to stay focused and you have to exercise self-control. If you have issues with your temper, this might well be a life-transforming suggestion. So let me repeat it one final time. No matter how angry you get, restrict the expression of your anger to the incident that provoked it. I'm Joseph Telushkin for Prager University. Do electric cars really help the environment? President Obama thinks so. So does Leonardo DiCaprio and many others. The argument goes like this. Regular cars run on gasoline, a fossil fuel that pumps CO2 straight out of the tailpipe and into the atmosphere. Electric cars run on electricity. They don't burn any gasoline at all. No gas, no CO2. In fact, electric cars are often advertised as creating zero emissions. But do they really? Let's take a closer look. First, there's the energy needed to produce the car. More than a third of the lifetime carbon dioxide emissions from an electric car comes from the energy used to make the car itself, especially the battery. The mining of lithium, for instance, is not a green activity. When an electric car rolls off the production line, it's already been responsible for more than 25,000 pounds of carbon dioxide emissions. The amount for making a conventional car, just 16,000 pounds. But that's not the end of the CO2 emissions. Because while it's true that electric cars don't run on gasoline, they do run on electricity, which in the US is often produced by another fossil fuel, coal. As green venture capitalist Vinod Kosla likes to point out, electric cars are coal-powered cars. The most popular electric car, the Nissan Leaf, over a 90,000 mile lifetime will emit 31 metric tons of CO2 based on emissions from its production, its electricity consumption, and average US fuel mix, and its ultimate scrapping. A comparable Mercedes CDI A160 over a similar lifetime will emit just three tons more across its production, diesel consumption, and ultimate scrapping. The results are similar for a top-line Tesla, the king of electric cars. It emits about 44 tons, which is only five tons less than a similar Audi A7 Quattro. So throughout the full life of an electric car, it will emit just three to five tons less CO2. In Europe, on its European trading system, it currently costs $7 to cut one ton of CO2. So the entire climate benefit of an electric car is about $35. Yet the US federal government essentially provides electric car buyers with a subsidy of up to $7,500. Paying $7,500 for something you could get for $35 is a very poor deal. And that doesn't include the billions more in federal and state grants, loans, and tax write-offs that go directly to battery and electric car makers. The other main benefit from electric cars is supposed to be lower pollution. But remember Vinod Kosla's observation, electric cars are coal-powered cars. Yes, it might be powered by coal, proponents will say, but unlike the regular car, coal plant emissions are far away from city centers, where most people live, and where damage from air pollution is greatest. However, new research in the proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences found that while gasoline cars pollute closer to home, coal fire power actually pollutes more, a lot more. How much more? Well, the researchers estimate that if the US has 10% more gasoline cars in 2020, 870 more people will die each year from the additional air pollution. If the US has 10% more electric vehicles powered on the average US electricity mix, 1,617 more people will die every year from the extra pollution. Twice as many. But of course, electricity from renewables like solar and wind creates energy for electric cars without CO2. Won't the perceived rapid ramp up of these renewables make future electric cars much cleaner? Unfortunately, this is mostly wishful thinking. Today, the US gets 14% of its electric power from renewables. In 25 years, Obama's Energy Information Administration estimates that number will have gone up 
just 3 percentage points to 17%. Meanwhile, those fossil fuels that generate 65% of US electricity today will still generate about 64% of it in 2040. While electric car owners may cruise around feeling virtuous, the reality is that the electric car cuts almost no CO2, costs taxpayers a fortune, and surprisingly generates more air pollution than traditional gasoline cars. I'm Bjorn Lomborg, president of the Copenhagen Consensus Center. Does the truth matter? Not to groups like Black Lives Matter. That's tragic for many reasons, not the least of which is that black lives are being lost as a result. When it comes to the subject of American police, blacks, and the deadly use of force, here is what we know. A recent deadly force study by Washington State University researcher Lois James found that police officers were less likely to shoot unarmed black suspects than unarmed white or Hispanic ones in simulated threat scenarios. Harvard economics professor Roland Fryer analyzed more than 1,000 officer-involved shootings across the country. He concluded that there is zero evidence of racial bias in police shootings. In Houston, he found that blacks were 24% less likely than whites to be shot by officers, even though the suspects were armed or violent. Does the truth matter? An analysis of the Washington Post's police shooting database and of federal crime statistics reveals that fully 12% of all whites and Hispanics who die of homicide are killed by cops. By contrast, only 4% of black homicide victims are killed by cops. But isn't it a sign of bias that blacks make up 26% of police shooting victims, but only 13% of the national population? It is not, and common sense suggests why. Police shootings occur more frequently where officers confront armed or violently resisting suspects. Those suspects are disproportionately black. According to the most recent study by the Department of Justice, although blacks were only about 15% of the population in the 75 largest counties in the U.S., they were charged with 62% of all robberies, 57% of murders, and 45% of assaults. In New York City, Blacks commit over three-quarters of all shootings, though they are only 23% of the city's population. Whites, by contrast, commit under 2% of all shootings in the city, though they are 34% of the population. New York's crime disparities are repeated in virtually every racially diverse city in America. The real problem facing inner-city Black communities today is not the police, but criminals. In 2014, over 6,000 blacks were murdered, more than all white and Hispanic homicide victims combined. Who is killing them? Not the police and not white civilians, but other blacks. In fact, a police officer is 18 and a half times more likely to be killed by a black male than an unarmed black male is to be killed by a police officer. If the police ended all use of lethal force tomorrow, it would have a negligible impact on the black death by homicide rate. In Chicago, through just the first six and a half months of 2016, over 2,300 people were shot. That's a shooting an hour during some weekends. The vast majority of the victims were black. During the same period, the Chicago police shot 12 people, all armed and dangerous. That's one half of 1% of all shootings. Does the truth matter? If it does, here's a truth worth pondering. There is no government agency more dedicated to the proposition that black lives matter than the police. The proactive policing revolution that began in the mid-1990s has dramatically brought down the inner city murder rate and saved tens of thousands of black lives. Unfortunately, that crime decline is now in jeopardy. As I write in my book, The War on Cops, police officers are backing off of proactive policing in black neighborhoods thanks to the false narrative that police officers are infected with homicidal bias. As a result, violent crime is going up. In cities with large black populations, 
homicides in 2015 rose anywhere from 54% in Washington, D.C. to 90% in Cleveland. Overall, in the nation's 56 largest cities, homicides in 2015 rose 17%, a nearly unprecedented one-year spike. Many law-abiding residents of high-crime areas beg the police to maintain order, precisely the type of policing that the ACLU, progressive politicians, and the Obama Justice Department denounce as racist. This is tragic because when the police refrain from proactive policing, black lives are lost, lost because of a myth. The best research and data reach this conclusion, there is no evidence that police are killing blacks just because they're black. You now have the truth. Does it matter? I'm Heather McDonald of the Manhattan Institute for Prager University. Years ago, I interviewed Kwesi Nfume, then the president of the NAACP. As between the presence of white racism and the absence of black fathers, I asked him, which poses the bigger threat to the black community? Without missing a beat, he said, the absence of black fathers. It was President Barack Obama who said, we all know these statistics, that children who grow up without a father are five times more likely to live in poverty and commit crime, nine times more likely to drop out of school, and 20 times more likely to end up in prison. The Journal of Research on Adolescence confirms that even after controlling for varying levels of household income, Kids in father-absent homes are more likely to end up in jail, and kids who never had a father in the house are the most likely to wind up behind bars. In 1960, 5% of America's children entered the world without a mother and father married to each other. By 1980, it was 18%. By 2000, it had risen to 33%, and 15 years later, the number reached 41%. For blacks, even during slavery when marriage for slaves was illegal, black children were more likely than today to be raised by both their mother and father. Economist Walter Williams has written that, according to census data from 1890 to 1940, a black child was more likely to grow up with married parents than a white child. For blacks, out-of-wedlock births have gone from 25% in 1965 to 73% in 2015. For whites, from less than 5% to over 25%, and for Hispanics, out-of-wedlock births have risen to 53%. What happened to fathers? The answer is found in a basic law of economics. If you subsidize undesirable behavior, you will get more undesirable behavior. In 1949, the nation's poverty rate was 34%. By 1965, it was cut in half to 17%, all before President Lyndon Johnson's so-called War on Poverty. But after that war began in 1965, poverty began to flatline. From 1965 until now, the government has spent over $20 trillion to fight poverty. The poverty rate has remained unchanged, but the relationship between poor men and women has changed dramatically. That's because our generous welfare system allows women, in effect, to marry the government. And this makes it all too easy for men to abandon their traditional moral and financial responsibilities. Psychologists call such dependency learned helplessness. How do we know that the welfare state creates disincentives that hurt the very people we're trying to help? They tell us. In 1985, the Los Angeles Times asked both the poor and the non-poor whether poor women often have children to get additional benefits. Most of the non-poor respondents said no. However, 64% of poor respondents said yes. Now, who do you think is in a better position to know? Tupac Shakur, the late rapper, once said, I know for a fact that had I had a father, I'd have some discipline, I'd have more confidence. He admitted he began running with gangs because he wanted the things a father gives to a child, especially to a boy. Structure and protection. Your mother cannot calm you down the way a man can, Shakur said. You need a man to teach you how to be a man. In my book, Dear Father, Dear Son, 
I write about my rough, tough World War II Marine Staff Sergeant dad. Born in the Jim Crow South of Athens, Georgia, he was 14 at the start of the Great Depression. Growing up, I watched my father work two full-time jobs as a janitor. He also cooked for a rich family on the weekends and somehow managed to go to night school to get his GED. When I was 10, my father opened a small restaurant that he ran until he retired in his mid-80s. He was never angry or bitter and insisted that today's America was very different from the world of racial segregation and limited opportunity in which he grew up. Hard work wins, he told me and my brothers. You get out of life what you put into it. You can't control the outcome, but you are 100% in control of the effort. And before blaming other people, go to the nearest mirror and ask yourself, what could I have done to change the outcome? This advice shaped my life. Fathers matter. Until we have a government policy that makes that its first priority, nothing will change. I'm Larry Elder for Prager University. Let's talk about climate models. Specifically, let's talk about the climate models that attempt to predict the future temperature of the planet. But before we do, it's important that you know a little bit about me. I'm a physicist. I taught at Columbia University and then at Princeton for five decades. I've published over 200 peer-reviewed scientific papers. I have co-authored several books, including one of the first on how carbon dioxide emissions, CO2, affects the climate. I served as the director of the Office of Energy Research at the U.S. Department of Energy. And before that, I invented the sodium guide star, which is still used on most big astronomical telescopes, to measure and correct for atmospheric turbulence, that is, for the unpredictable movement of air and water. This turbulence blurs the images of stars and other space objects. One more thing. I care deeply about the environment. We live on a beautiful planet. I want to keep it that way. I've spent a lot of time working to do just that. In short, I know a lot about the Earth's atmosphere and climate. I also know a lot about long-term predictive climate models. And I know they don't work. They haven't worked in the past. They don't work now. And it's hard to imagine when, if ever, they'll work in the foreseeable future. There's a common sense reason for this. Aside from the human brain, the climate is the most complex thing on the planet. The number of factors that influence climate, the sun, the Earth's orbital properties, oceans, clouds, and yes, industrial man, is huge and enormously variable. Let me try to narrow this down. For the purposes of illustration, let's just focus our attention on water. The Earth is essentially a water planet. A major aspect of climate involves the complicated interaction between two very turbulent fluids. The atmosphere, which holds large amounts of water, think rain and snow, and the oceans, which cover fully 70% of the Earth's surface. We can't predict what effect the atmosphere is going to have on future temperatures because we can't predict cloud formations and the convection of heat, oxygen, salt, and other quantities that pass through the oceans, not to mention weather cycles like El Nino in the tropical Pacific, make predicting ocean temperatures an equally difficult business. We can't predict either side of the atmosphere-ocean equation, but we can say this with certainty. Water in all its phases has huge effects on atmospheric heating and cooling. Compared to water, H2O, Carbon dioxide, CO2, is a minor contributor to the warming of the Earth. It's devilishly difficult to predict what a fluid will do. Trying to figure out what two fluids will do in interaction with each other on a planetary scale over long periods of time is close to impossible. Anyone who followed the forecast of Hurricane Irma's path in the late summer of 2017 should understand this. First, the models predicted a direct hit on Miami and the east coast of Florida. Then to find these predictions, the hurricane suddenly veered to the west coast of Florida. In other words, even with massive amounts of real-time data, the models still could not accurately predict Irma's path two days in advance. 
Does any rational person believe that computer models can precisely predict temperatures decades from now? The answer is they can't. That's why over the last 30 years, one climate prediction after another based on computer models has been wrong. They're wrong because even the most powerful computers can't solve all the equations needed to accurately describe climate. Instead of admitting this, some climate scientists replace the highly complex equations that describe the real world climate with highly simplified ones, their computer models. Discarding the unmanageable details, modelers tune their simplified equations with lots of adjustable inputs, numbers that can be changed to produce whatever result the modelers want. So if they want to show that the Earth's temperature at the end of the century will be two degrees centigrade higher than it is now, they put in the numbers that produce that result. That's not science. That's science fiction. I'm Will Happer, Emeritus Professor of Physics at Princeton University for Prager University. Have you ever heard the old saying that a conservative is just a liberal who got mugged? Well, I got mugged to the tune of $60,000 a year. It's called tuition. Like everyone who cons themselves into attending a liberal arts college, I was captivated by the idea of changing the world. I would immerse myself in a diverse pool of academic thought, theory, and action. Well, it didn't quite work out that way. Over the course of four years, I was transformed from a plucky, free-thinking, free spirit into a cranky, get-off-my-lawn conservative. The process started not long after I arrived at my elite East Coast school. I thought I was there to expand my knowledge of the world, to debate the great ideas. I soon realized, however, that my professors had something else in mind. Invariably, each class followed the same monotonous ritual. Identify a problem, say racism, blow it up beyond all proportion, blame the problem on the white majority culture, and then offer an unworkable solution, usually involving the government. Everywhere I turned, I saw political correctness. At first, I just rolled with it. Then I got annoyed. Then it started to tick me off. I was being brainwashed, indoctrinated, and I was paying for the privilege with borrowed money. Almost every speaker who came to campus was a leftist journalist, a leftist activist, or a leftist professor from another leftist school. The ones who weren't leftists were just weird. One time, I attended a film lecture given by a very skilled paraplegic adult film star who showed us some of her art. Another time, I went to a performance given by a woman who engaged in auto-eroticism behind a curtain. I couldn't deal with it. The PC culture, the mono-thinking, the weirdness. I needed some way to cope. So I got high almost every day. Parenthetically, most of the worst stoners I knew are now working in finance or politics. In fact, this is what made me first realize that I was a fan of limited government. I do not trust these goofs to make policy. Their power must be constrained. This brings me to another black hole in the college experience. Useless majors, the only thing more pervasive than marijuana and irresponsible future leaders. I'm not being judgmental here. I have a degree in film and media studies and political science. Why did I choose them? They're subjects I like talking about. Practical, right? But I wasn't alone. Most of my peers also chose to spend their student loan money on subjects better learned on YouTube or Turner Classic Movies. By the time graduation approached, none of us had developed any actual job skills. And people want to raise taxes to pay for free college for everyone? <laughs> Are you kidding me? No, just no. I'd only give a free education to a smart kid who promised to get a degree in whatever the exact opposite of my degree is. And that degree didn't come cheap. I took on tens of thousands of dollars of debt, but never spent a minute learning how to manage it. No such classes were even offered. I might have actually learned something useful if they had been. I didn't learn about taxes either, other than that the rich should pay their fair share. It was only after college, when I was lucky enough to get my first job, that I discovered the truth. The government takes away a lot of your money. Frankly, it's shocking. And that's not even counting the mandatory $400 a month deduction for my student loans. I'll probably have that albatross around my neck for the rest of my life. Really, I can't believe my peers and I spent so much time shaming conservatives for wanting to lower taxes. A past version of myself would call this desire to keep what I earn selfish. 
the current cheerfully realistic version of me knows this. I can spend my money much better than the politically correct stoners who are running the government can. So I guess, in a roundabout way, I did get something of value out of my expensive liberal arts education after all. Common sense. I'm Jay Stevens for Prager University. For over 39 years, I was a police officer in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. For 15 of those years, I was the sheriff of Milwaukee County. I've done everything you can do as a cop, from walking the beat to investigating murder to running the agency. I've met a lot of cops of every race, ethnicity, and background. Here's what I can tell you. Cops are not perfect. That's not a news flash, but this might be. They don't have to be perfect. They have to be excellent. And most officers reach excellence every single day and often under very difficult circumstances, circumstances you can't imagine and wouldn't want to if you could. Perfection is an unattainable goal. Cops are ordinary human beings, like everyone else. Lawyers, surgeons, and baseball players, they make mistakes. But no profession works harder to correct its mistakes. You can mark social progress by the improvements made by police departments over the last 50 years. Today, police are more professional, better educated, and better trained than at any time in their history. You wouldn't know it, though, if you listened to self-serving, self-righteous politicians and activists. In their version of history, the police are the villains of the story, not its heroes. Like everything else this crowd does, they've got it all backwards. The police aren't the problem. The politicians and activists are. The police didn't create the failed urban policies that have locked people into generational poverty. The police aren't responsible for fatherless homes, failing schools, and bad lifestyle choices. And they sure as hell aren't responsible for the lack of respect shown to police officers. It is this lack of respect for authority, fostered over decades by the progressive left and its fear the police narrative, that has led to the needless deaths of so many young black men. When Officer Darren Wilson told Michael Brown to get out of the middle of the street in Ferguson, Missouri, did Brown comply? No. When officers in Baltimore told Freddie Gray to stop resisting arrest, did he comply? No. When officers in New York City told Eric Garner to stop resisting arrest, did he comply? No. Here's a useful tip. If you want to avoid a bad outcome with a police officer, follow this simple rule. When a cop gives you a lawful command, obey it, even if you disagree. Whatever problem you are experiencing is not going to be settled on the street. People with complaints need to use the process established for that purpose. Though cops don't have the final say, they do in that moment. How you react can be a matter of life or death. But the idea that a law-abiding citizen has to fear the police is a terrible and destructive lie. Let's get some perspective. In 2014, 990 people were killed in police use of force incidents. Does that sound like a lot? Did you know that according to a Johns Hopkins study, that same year medical errors killed 250,000 people, yet activists aren't marching in the streets demanding that the medical profession be reformed? Why not? Why is it that the people who protect you from the bad guys, and I've seen these bad guys close up, are the subject of distrust and anger? Why is it that groups like Black Lives Matter, I call them Black Lies Matter, because it's based on the falsehood that police represent a danger to black people, are celebrated by the media and politicians? All this is taking its toll on cops, and even more tragically, on the law-abiding citizens in the neighborhoods that most need a strong police presence. The murder rates in these neighborhoods are going up because lawful, aggressive policing is going down. Heather McDonald of the Manhattan Institute has explained why. She calls it the Ferguson effect. And it's real. It's also common sense. Why, police officers reason, put your career at risk if 30 seconds of smartphone video taken out of context can destroy it. Here's the truth. Police aren't afraid of walking the streets or being shot by random criminals. They're afraid of being involved in an incident that would label them forever as trigger-happy racists. Are there bad cops? I know firsthand that there are. 
I've had to fire them. But the overwhelming majority are good, decent men and women concerned about the law-abiding citizens in the communities they serve and are willing to put their lives on the line to protect them. Those who try to convince you, either out of ignorance or out of some ideological agenda, that the police are the enemy, those are the people you should fear. Run from them, not the cops. I'm Sheriff David Clark for Prager University. He's a fascist. For decades, this has been a favorite smear of the left aimed at those on the right. Every Republican president, for that matter, virtually every Republican, since the 1970s has been called a fascist, now more than ever. This label is based on the idea that fascism is a phenomenon of the political right. The left says it is, and some self-styled white supremacists and neo-Nazis embrace the label. But are they correct? To answer this question, we have to ask what fascism really means. What is its underlying ideology? Where does it even come from? These are not easy questions to answer. We know the name of the philosopher of capitalism, Adam Smith. We know the name of the philosopher of Marxism, Karl Marx. But who's the philosopher of fascism? Yes, exactly. You don't know. Don't feel bad. Almost no one knows. This is not because he doesn't exist but because historians, most of whom are on the political left, had to erase him from history in order to avoid confronting fascism's actual beliefs. So let me introduce him to you. His name is Giovanni Gentile. Born in 1875, he was one of the world's most influential philosophers in the first half of the 20th century. Gentile believed that there were two diametrically opposed types of democracy. One is liberal democracy, such as that of the United States, which Gentile dismisses as individualistic, too centered on liberty and personal rights, and therefore selfish. The other, the one Gentile recommends, is true democracy, in which individuals willingly subordinate themselves to the state. Like his philosophical mentor Karl Marx, Gentile wanted to create a community that resembles the family, a community where we are all in this together, it's easy to see the attraction of this idea. Indeed, it remains a common rhetorical theme of the left. For example, at the 1984 convention of the Democratic Party, the governor of New York, Mario Cuomo, likened America to an extended family, where, through the government, people all take care of each other. Nothing's changed. 30 years later, a slogan of the 2012 Democratic Party convention was, the government is the only thing we all belong to they might as well have been quoting Gentile. Now remember, Gentile was a man of the left. He was a committed socialist. For Gentile, fascism is a form of socialism, indeed, its most workable form. While the socialism of Marx mobilizes people on the basis of class, fascism mobilizes people by appealing to their national identity as well as their class. Fascists are socialists with a national identity. German fascists in the 1930s were called Nazis, basically a contraction of the term National Socialist. For Gentile, all private action should be oriented to serve society. There's no distinction between the private interest and the public interest. Correctly understood, the two are identical. And who is the administrative arm of society? It's none other than the state. Consequently, to submit to society is to submit to the state, not just in economic matters, but in all matters. Since everything is political, the state gets to tell everyone how to think and what to do. It was another Italian, Benito Mussolini, the fascist dictator of Italy from 1922 to 1943, who turned Gentile's words into action. In his Dottrina del Fascismo, one of the doctrinal statements of early fascism, Mussolini wrote, All is in the state, and nothing human exists or has value outside the state. He was merely paraphrasing Gentile. The Italian philosopher is now lost in obscurity. But his philosophy could not be more relevant because it closely parallels that of the modern left. Gentile's work speaks directly to progressives who champion the centralized state. 
Here in America, the left has vastly expanded state control over the private sector, from healthcare to banking, from education to energy. This state-directed capitalism is precisely what German and Italian fascists implemented in the 1930s. Leftists can't acknowledge their man Gentile because that would undermine their attempt to bind conservatism to fascism. Conservatism wants small government so that individual liberty can flourish. The left, like Gentile, wants the opposite, to place the resources of the individual and industry in the service of a centralized state. To acknowledge Gentile is to acknowledge that fascism bears a deep kinship to the ideology of today's left. So they will keep Gentile where they've got him, dead, buried, and forgotten. But we should remember, or the ghost of fascism will continue to haunt us. I'm Dinesh D'Souza for Prager University. Participation trophies. I'm not a fan. They're bad for kids, bad for parents, bad for society. Other than that, they're okay. Don't get me wrong. I love any kind of organized competition for kids. I lived and breathed baseball, basketball, football, and soccer growing up. If there was a sport to be played, I played it. And never once did anybody ever tell me that winning was not important or that showing up was all that mattered. But today, kids get a different message. Losing, no big deal. Showing up, that deserves a trophy. Wow, what an awful thing to tell a kid. Glad my parents or coaches never said it to me. If they had, I'm sure I never would have become a pro soccer player. Let me tell you why. In high school, I was a good soccer player. I thought I could play soccer in college. Looking back though, I just wasn't good enough in those college coaches' eyes. I tried out for the UCLA team as a walk-on. I made it. I was vindicated. I had arrived on the bench. The coach hardly ever looked at me. I'm not even sure he knew my name. I know he didn't care about my feelings. I wanted to be a starter. I wanted to be a winner. Shouldn't I have been satisfied just for making the team? Of course not. That's absurd. But isn't that what kids are told today? You're a winner, even if you're not. Even if you come in last and we'll give you a trophy just for showing up just for participating. This belief that showing up as an accomplishment is self-destructive because the pain of losing is part of what drives one to improve. The frustration of going to game after game and sitting on the bench drove me nuts. I had to practice more. I had to work harder or I had to give up and I didn't want to give up. This taught me an important lesson if you don't put in the work, you won't get ahead. And not getting ahead, well, that feels awful. So put in the work or go home. So I put in the work. I pushed myself not to do my best because who can possibly know what their best is but to be better and better. And one day my chance came. Coach put me in the game, not because I wanted so badly to play, but because he needed me. I played well, well enough to start the next game where I scored a goal and had an assist. After that, I started every game. The road to victory in sports, in business, in life is paved with losses, painful losses, losses that can hurt so much it's hard to breathe. Any professional athlete or successful entrepreneur will tell you that's true. But participation trophies? Everybody is the valedictorian, and let's all pat each other on the back awards communicate a different message. They tell you that losing doesn't matter. It matters. They tell you that competition is, at best, not important, and at worst, dangerous. I wonder how my soccer career would have turned out if I'd grown up with these ideas in my head. I was cut twice during the tryout period for the 1992 Olympics. My pro soccer team, the LA Galaxy, lost three times in the championship before we finally won in 2002. Guess what? I survived all these disappointments and a whole lot more. They only made victory that much sweeter. 
In the real world, you're rewarded for achievement, not effort. Promotions don't go to the employees who did their best. They go to the employees who did the best. But what if the kids can't handle losing? What if it's too painful? That's the whole point. It's your job as the adult, as the parent, to help them understand that losing, that not getting what they want, is a part of life. Nobody likes to fail, but it's inevitable. And it's the only path, ultimately, to success. Yes, showing up and participating is important. Trying your best is important, but neither deserves a trophy. If you want one of those, go win something. I'm Kobe Jones for Prager University. Thank you for watching this video. To help keep PragerU videos free, please consider making a tax-deductible donation.